To start, I apologize in advance for the length of this story, and want to firmly make sure that I do not care if it is believed or not. If you cannot believe it, well, I can only say, I understand, and I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't experienced it. This was three years ago. I was doing postgraduate study which concerned Aboriginal communities. I was allowed a placement in the Yungu town of Raminjining in Arnhem Land, which is a tiny strip of halfway urbanized land that borders the huge fuck-off bog which is rather kindly called Arafura Swamp. The swamp is probably one of the most wild places in Australia. Imagine a country-sized swath of perpetually decaying forest flooded in a stagnant, foul-smelling water plain, and with crocs a real danger. My place was basically a shack, and it was right at the edge of the swamp. It was technically not within the town limits, and actually sat a good couple of miles away along a dirt road. It was an abandoned country house, and I had it all to myself. The back had a veranda that looked out over the great black swamp. There were some very impressive views come dusk. And on either side it was enclosed in a dusty circle of eucalyptus. Now I knew literally no one out there. And I won't lie when I say it was pretty creepy those first few weeks trying to acclimate to being more truly alone than I ever had before in this rusty, old, tin shed of a house halfway out of town in a clearing at the edge of the swamp. But, adaptiveness is a virtue, and I soon found myself spending my spare time fixing up the place, and even planting seed out in the front and chopping some of the smaller trees down. I remember my pride as I felled the small tree for the first time, after hours of panting heat. When I went into town and sold off the wood, I told the folk there it had taken a lot less time than it really did. They were all really well accustomed to hard labor, and it was quite a culture shock when I took a dinner at homes that didn't have a television, let alone a computer. The people did not all live in exactly what would be termed poverty, as some places were wealthier than others in the typical sense. And there was a real effort at maintaining a distance from some norms of outer society anyway. For example, there was, and remains, a ban on booze that was taken fairly seriously while I was there. So, I was sober for a full year. Although many hearing my story have suggested I was drunk or high. The first month or so was rocky, but it was invigorating and really kept me going. As I've said, I struggled a bit with the isolation and having to spend my time doing things I never would, like tilling the soil and chopping timber wood. But it was good detox, and after a while, the smell of the swamp got less shit. At first, the sounds of the different birds and nightlife damn near kept me up at night, but in time... I learned to distinguish the birds and reptile noises and found comfort in them. On two occasions, I was lucky enough to hear the booming voice of a croc near the house. It was real back-to-nature shit, and by the second month, I really got into the swing of it and had adapted fully to having long periods of time alone with myself in the bush. It was some time this second month that it first happened, though at the time, well, I thought nothing of it. I was sitting on the back veranda on a very warm, crisp afternoon. I was reading, I think, when after some time I became aware of a strange silence. I had to strain my ears for a while, but soon I could confirm that there was only the sounds of a slight breeze, the soft movement of water, and the creak of my rocking chair. The usually all-enveloping choir of birds, bugs, and frogs had at some point subsided. As I registered this sudden silence, a feeling like no other crawled down me and I actually physically shuddered. It was like my bones were briefly frosted, 
and I was washed over with an internal coldness and a tingle throughout my body. I became very dizzy, and I thought I might vomit, so I stood up, and in the second that I put my head down, it happened, and was over before I could register what I had seen. Now it's impossible how to describe how I must be perceived at the time. All I could say is that I saw a nearby tree, a long thin white spear that stood some distance back from and beneath a couple of bigger ones. This tree, like many others, well, it had shed its branches, leaving just the thin trunk standing upright. What I saw was this tree twitching rapidly, like it was having some fucking seizure, before wriggling into place and going still again. Now, no other tree nearby did the same thing. I doubted my own eyes. Dizziness forgotten, I stared at it for a long time. Not terribly scared, but not particularly comfortable either. I could not tell what I had seen and whether or not it was a side effect of a head rush or not. The tree just stood there, still as ever, and I noticed the bird's song had come back and warmth returned to my body, and I forgot about it for a long time. I had gotten in with a school teacher in the area, and now spent three weekdays getting to talk to kids at the education center, so I was spending less daylight hours at the house. On those swamp plot dusks, I would tend to sit on the veranda and have a quiet smoke, maybe read until night came. That summer was turning into whatever season came next. This cycle was not very pronounced in that region, which remains humid most of the year. I noticed an increase in insects. Now, I don't mind bugs, but I think everyone is slightly creeped out by those long-legged flying crane flies. But in that area, they're called daddy longlegs. I remember sitting at the veranda and seeing for the first time a great swarm of the things. Maybe just hatched forming great clouds against the orangey light of the sky. The crane flies in the swamp got so big, you could hear them rustling against each other. And, well, that's no exaggeration. These things could be meters away, and you could hear the vibration sound of their wings. As I say, I'm not too afraid of bugs, but when I went to take a piss in the middle of the night, the toilet was a bit of an outhouse and find myself in a cramped space with a goal-sized crane fly buzzing around the light, occasionally bumping into me and feeling my body with its long, horrible legs. Well, I was a tad on edge. The other bug, which began to cause me some anxiety, was some kind of mollusk, like a barnacle which would appear in clumps on the water edge after it had been raining. Now, these things weren't particularly creepy. But they worried me because they grow rapidly and would often spread to the steps on their veranda. I'd asked the local fisherman how to remove them, and he went into his truck and returned with a metal paint scraper. So I added the job of scraping these little barnacle things off the old wooden steps. It was not fun experiencing their reddish interior bodies, the way they peeled off like a hard-shelled scab, and the truly noxious smell. Aside from the growing presence of the insects inside and outside the house, well, I was keeping well. I kept clearing the area of weed plants and chopping down little trees to sell in the town, as well as insects the seasonal change had brought a tide of litter in the water, which I was told happened every year. More and more clumps of old plastics and bottles and crap was accumulating in a line of detritus outside the house. I started picking it up in the mornings, keeping the water clean while I was there. It was as I did this one morning that, for whatever reason, I chose to look directly up at that old white tree I'd briefly freaked out over, and I saw that it was not there. At first, I was more confused than frightened. I paced the waterline, convinced I had mistaken where it was placed. 
But no, there was no mistake. Everything about the area looked as it always had, clear in my mind for many evenings study. All but that little tree, where now there was just a bare spot of land. I had no time to think of it, but as I spent the day teaching, I more and more dreaded the return home. I even tried to arrange for a couple of friends I had made to come over that night, but they insisted on postponing till the weekend. So I drove home alone that night, and when I got back, it was full dark. The evening calls of the owls and swamp birds gave me a little comfort. I couldn't shake the image of that shivering tree. I had no reason to think anything of it, nor what it might mean but the image, like a horrible glitch in reality, pestered me no matter how much I tried to distract myself. And you know, I'll never forget that night. As I lay wide awake in the dark, hearing outside my window this sound, this slow, drawn-out creak and cracking noise. I'd heard it before. One sound of the forest out of many, but on this night, it pierced my frayed nerves. I lay there for a long time listening to it. It sounded like some kind of rickety pole, or swaying barely inches from my window. I was... well, I was too shit-scared cowardly to look out that window. So I examined the patch of moonlight it cast on the floor. And I could see so many moving things. The limbs of the trees and the wind. That was impossible to make out anything else. And then, with total clarity, I heard this dreadful noise. Tap. Tap, tap. Against the glass. There was no mishearing it, no denying it. As plain as day, there was something tapping the glass just above my head. Now, there was no tree growing near the window, nor even a bush or anything else for that matter. I frantically tried to think up contrived reasons. Maybe the guttering had fallen loose and was tapping on the glass in the wind, or it was one of those crane flies hitting the glass. But I couldn't bring myself to look, and I laid there, rigid, pretending to be asleep. I waited like this for about 20 minutes before the noise faded. It took me a while to work up the nerve to look out, but of course, when I did, there was nothing there. After a while, it was easier to convince myself that it actually had been something normal, that it was just a minor thing and I got to sleep. The next day was particularly bright. It was that kind of heat which is thick and palpable in the air, which is saying something given the usual weather. In a way, my memory of the day, revisited so many times, is saturated in heat, like how a photo gets dimmed over time when it's left in the light. When first I got up, it was just another day. The events of the previous night and the odd tree were forgotten as I went through the automatic morning rituals. It hadn't really gotten hot yet, and everything was nicely lit. The view of the swamp was gorgeous. The sun behind the canopy seemed to frost every leaf with gold. There was an upswell of bird noise. I saw a couple of birds out looking for frogs or lizards, anticipating the heat of the day. Now, I worked a lot on my studies in the morning. After a few too many coffees, I came down with that overstimulated restlessness. I couldn't focus on work anymore, continuously looking out the window and finding chores to do. The view out of the window was especially appealing. The caffeine and the brightness projected everything in rich detail. Seeing some rubbish on the shoreline, I convinced myself to dredge it out. And so, happily, I went down to the water and mucked about the little islands and rivulets picking up the junk that had floated in overnight. Or maybe some had just been bobbing there for a long time before I came. It was hard to tell. I was stacking it up into a little pile of gunk. Now, this is 
when some strange things happened, all in one moment. I noticed the bound book, half buried at a detritus bank around the shoreline. Consciously, I picked it out of the rest, having a feeling about it. And so I crack it open. It's a bit encased in mud. And I opened up a couple of pages. It was the annual collected issues of a business journal. And there were lots of different issues with covers and stuff. It seemed business-oriented. At the back, however, was a list of the year's grants. That included scholarships for university work. Scrolling the list of scholarship grants, I saw my, in plain delight, my name. Now, I haven't told this story to many people, but whenever I do, they seemed unimpressed by this fact. I mean, of course it was there. I did have a scholarship, and it was a business journal with a list of scholarship grants. I know, and I'm not saying it was paranormal necessarily. But, understand how weird it felt to be the furthest you've ever been from home. Pick a random book out of the water, and you see your own name in it. Now, regardless of how stupid it was, I shivered. I closed the book and put it in the junk pile. Then I stood to get up, and I saw a man standing on the other side of the stream watching me. Now already a little unsettled, I nearly fucking shat myself when I saw him. It wasn't just that I hadn't seen a single other person on the property since I'd been there. It wasn't just that he was standing there, silently looking at me. He was also standing half behind the trunk of a tree, so I could only see one arm and a leg, and one half of his face. But he wasn't hidden at all, and couldn't have been trying to be. He was just standing halfway behind a tree. His shirt and pants were brown-gray and pretty faded into the background, but his face and limbs were white and they stood out in contrast. Before I have time to collect myself, I see his one arm waving at me. It was a friendly gesture, not in a threatening way at all. I waved back and then stand there not knowing what to do because he doesn't make any movement. He just stays exactly where he is, looking at me. There's no way I'm approaching this guy, so I just wave again, kind of vaguely pointing towards my house to indicate I'm going inside or something. He waves back, but still doesn't move. So I head back to the house, trying to carefully maintain a steady pace, for some reason not wanting to walk too fast to give away how rattled I was. But once I did dare look over my shoulder and caught a sight of his leg, turned back and going into the forest. Now, slightly relieved, I went back home and locked the doors. I wanted to latch the windows, but the heat contained in the house was already great enough with them open. The wallpaper glue was visible on the walls like sweat. The isolated events now weighed on me heavily. While previously none of these weird incidents had overwhelmed my experience, I was now unable to start my heart from racing, stop scaring myself with thoughts of that fucking man standing behind that tree. With great difficulty, I calmed myself enough to decide that heading into town was the best option. Not trusting the security of the place, I decided I would bring my laptop and some stuff. So. I'm sitting at the table, brooding over my breakfast bowl, and I become aware of a disturbance of light on my right hand side. I turn, and holy shit, there's a face there. I swore aloud and stood up, nerves on the edge of actually splitting. The face leans back and I see two arms raise. It's a man his shirt and whiteness making me instantly aware it's the creep from the swamp. I hear him say, oh, Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you, or something like that, and say he didn't know the place was occupied, 
that he saw me down on the swamp and was intrigued by a stranger to the place, and he asked to come in. I said yes. I mean, what else could I do? And I went to open the front door for him. For a moment, he stood on the doorstep, then smiled and gave me his hand to shake and said, thanks and nice to meet you and such. Then he came in. Up close, this guy looked pretty old. He was covered in a dark tan, but clearly white, and his skin looked pretty cracked up and wrinkled in places. His face had a spooky quality. Even though it wasn't particularly fucked up, it's just hard to explain. It wasn't a major difference or anything, but his face and especially his expression just seemed a bit younger somehow than the rest of him. I was probably just dazed off of the heat in the day's events, but this has always stayed in my memory. How his face was just a little off. You know, come to think of it, it was sort of awkward. Me walking pointlessly into the kitchen and him standing in the doorway between it and the hall, smiling but not talking. I asked if he wanted coffee and he said, sure, and sat down. Then asked about me and what I was doing out in the swamps. And then I told him about my studies and such, sort of vaguely, tentative to not say too much to this weird smiling old guy. But as it turned out, well, he didn't seem to be remotely interested in me at all. He just smiled dozily, and as soon as I stopped talking, he started telling me about himself, without any indication of hearing what I just said. I put down the coffees and sat myself at the table as he carried on excitedly. He would sometimes get ahead of himself and just end a sentence with a jumble of gibberish words in this thick bushman accent. He didn't seem immediately threatening, but I definitely did not feel he was of his right mind. He said he lived up north, but lived off the land in the swamp most of the time. For a long time, he just spoke of tilling the soil and catching his own food, living in huts and stuff. But then he awkwardly cracked out a peal of laughter and asked loudly, You got a girl in here? Now, I was pretty taken aback, but before I could answer, his smile completely flipped, and he asked, suddenly stern, almost angry, Is there a girl in here, mate? I shook my head, but now the atmosphere had changed completely. He was gripping the table hard. And then, just as quickly as it came on, this moment passed, and he continued as if nothing happened. It was the most schizo thing. I'd ever seen. I can't even remember what he said after that, but eventually he showed himself out. Coffee left untouched, and after walking a while down to the swamp, looked back at me and said, as if touching on a shared joke, couldn't keep a girl safe here anyway, and he walked off. Fairly creeped out, I locked up and took my gear and the car out to town. The heat wasn't letting up and the car ride is in my mind a bit of a haze. Outside the school I saw another teacher packing her things into her own car. She waved and I pulled up beside her. I must have looked shaken because she asked what was the matter with me. I told her about the weird man, to which she grinned knowingly and said, Did he scare you? She said he was mischievous but harmless. I remember her words. Uh, he'll fuck with you, but he doesn't hurt a fly. If it is him. She said he wasn't often seen, and it was as if she was talking about a folk tale more than a real man. Apparently this man had lived near the area about nine or ten years ago. As recently as that, he had been a regular visitor to the town, and a well-liked guy. She had been much younger then, but remembered that he would drive through town and sell vegetables and homemade jam, that he was fondly regarded by most. His wife was typically with him. She described them as a sweet old couple. The two were regarded highly enough that when his wife passed away, she was buried near the grounds, and some friends from the town helped do the funeral. 
The guy was obviously distraught and seemed completely shell-shocked for a long time after it happened. His trips into town got less and less regular. His demeanor seemed subtly changed, still jolly but in a different, stranger way. His behavior was increasingly odd. Everyone understood his pain following the death of his only real close company, so when he referred to her in passing, her daily doings, as if she wasn't dead, there was mostly just sympathy, as well as the expectation that with some support, he would get back to his old self. But things were only downhill from there. There were uncomfortable encounters where he asked people if they'd seen her around, to which there could be no easy response. And the discomfort was not lessened when he started showing up disoriented, crying, telling people his wife had gone missing and that a search party needed to be formed immediately. And things came to a head when someone refused to dance around the issue and simply told him the fact of the matter. His wife was dead, buried not far out of town. By all accounts, the man's response had been shocked, though not as unhinged as perhaps expected. He sort of sadly accepted what he'd been told and wasn't seen around town for a while. But when the next he came back, his behavior was only more messed up. He announced that he didn't trust a single fucking aborigine, and that he knew they'd done something with his wife. After some drunken spiels against the aborigines and anger at their having stolen his wife, keeping her captive somewhere, he was strongly dissuaded by some local leaders from coming into the town as he had used to, and seemed to understand because he wasn't seen in the town again. Word spread from some of the northern bars that he'd been seen drunk as a fish, telling anyone who would listen that the swamp aborigines that tormented his wife in her final days, uh, driving her mad with their mischief, and how he hadn't believed her until it was too late. He was now fully convinced that a tribe had taken her away, and were holding her captive somewhere in the swamp. It also emerged that he had lost his house and his car, but he was still seen from time to time at the outskirts of the swamp, hunting. Eventually, he wasn't even a regular at any of the bars, and as the years passed, he kind of faded into a half-mythical creature, the mad old man of the swamp. But yet, he was real. Sometimes hunting parties from town would see him, even trade with him despite his now full-fledged hostility towards any and all aborigines he met. So, this was the story that she told me. She stressed, as I will hear, that she couldn't confirm any of this. Having only memories of his happy years and having not seen him since, some of the tale probably was just the garnishing of a legend. But that he was out in the swamp for long periods at a time was certain, and the hunting parties which came across him always reported that he was convinced of his wife's continued existence as a captive to some unknown tribe somewhere in the swamp. Now let me tell you something. This tale, well, left me feeling overwhelmed. Exhausted, but nonetheless a bit relieved. The frightfulness of this man was cut down a fair bit by the patheticness of his story, and I felt a bit sorry for him. But I didn't want to go home for a while, I spent some time alone in town before heading back out. I got home just past dusk, when there was still a faint light about things, but as I tentatively looked around the house, half expecting something to pop out and spook me, I was aware of a greater darkness than usual. It took me a while, but I investigated the windows, and found that on those facing the swamp, there was a growing layer of those barnacle-looking mollusks. It's hard to describe what it was like seeing a cluster of these cramped up on the glass, but if you've seen the inside of a rock clinger, the fleshy part under the shell, well, you've got a good idea. Hell, I almost gagged. I didn't much want to, but 
I worked up the nerve to go out and scrape them off. And well, the whole bottom part of the wall was practically packed with them. A lot had been there a long time, and maybe had dried up and hardened in the sun, because scraping them off was like pulling teeth. And when they finally fell down, they took a wee bit of splintered wood with them. Darkness settled and I was still going, working by the indoor lights and by my torch. It was only once I'd finished, leaving a sickly smelling pile of the things at the base of the wall. Piles of husks I couldn't be bothered to do anything with. That I realized how late it was, and the deep silence that permeated everything. Little sounds were painfully heightened, enhanced by my frayed nerves, like the tiny drops of water somewhere nearby as a bird or a fish or something moved about, and the slight rustling of leaves on a mostly still night, I had the feeling of being watched. Now I was well aware that it was just my mind playing tricks on me, but after the day's events I couldn't be fucked with putting up with this mischievous old man. So I quickly shone the torch across the tree line, fast enough to catch him if he tried to run away. But there was nothing. So I dragged the light along the bank slowly, scanning carefully for any signs of movement. And every sound I heard was him messing with me. And I shook a little. Then, as my grip steadied, I saw it. A cluster of dead vines, or a tree maybe half slumped, half wrapped around the base of a big old conifer. For whatever reason, I couldn't help but focus on it. Something about it seemed distinctly out of place. Now remember, I'd have a long time to get to know the paranoia of the swamp, and something uncertain struck me about this white clump. And then, in one horrible movement, it pulled back and went behind the tree. For a moment, I could do nothing, paralyzed by fear when the silence was broken by loud series of creaking and cracking sounds, and I knew something large was moving through the bush. Wasting no time, I bolted indoors, and you can imagine the sleepless night I spent there, damn near pissing myself every time I heard an owl or the house creak. And the smell of those fucking barnacles had permeated the house. The smell alone, like sulfur, could have kept me up. But the tapping from my room resonated into the living room, where I huddled on the floor. Somehow, the crane flies were getting in, and now and again one would land near me, and I'd have to crush it. I remember hearing a sort of clicking sound and looking up to see my ceiling coated in the things. As I looked at their black mass of bodies, the tapping seemed to register my pulse, getting louder and faster. I was sweating profusely, scared to look at the windows, trying to ignore the heat and the bugs and the tapping, until it was too much and I switched on the television. It was an old set that still had rabbit ears and picked up barely the glitchiest signal, but at least it was drowning out the tapping. The screen just showed static, and the vaguest form of what looked like an infomercial or something. But the sound quality was perfect when I heard it. Within seconds of switching it on, annual scholarship grant has been awarded to Anon Anonymous, who will be doing field work up in Arnhem. Congratulations, Anon. The words just registered dimly, and I couldn't be fucked up anymore, so I just left the set on, and the sound worked for a couple more names before giving out and giving way to a soft static, which I turned up the full volume. The tapping noted this and got louder, beating like a metronome. At this stage, I was almost laughing. I felt a bit delirious and couldn't get a grasp on if this was really happening or not. Then, a different sound beat down the corridor. A hard, loud knock at the front door. And I waited in terrified stillness. Then came another knock, and a voice. Hey, Nan, you home? 
The voice was familiar. My friends from the town. I'd forgotten they were coming over on the weekend. Hey, Nan? We're meant to be hanging out, remember? Why was he over at three in the morning? Oh, come on, man, I can see you through the window. I looked up at the big windows but could see the dark night outside. Maybe I could see some vague thing. My friend waving? Or just trees brushing up against each other or bugs at the window. It was impossible to tell. The thought of letting another person in made me realize the state I was in. The number of bugs on the walls and the ceiling. And that god-awful smell. I shouted out that I was going to let them in, just wait a minute. But no response. As I scaled the corridor, I noticed that I couldn't hear the tapping anymore. I flicked on the outdoor light but couldn't make out a thing through the dappled glass window on the door. I took the handle and cranked open the big front door, then looked out onto an empty deck in the barren front section. I called out if he was there or not. Then, from behind me, I hear the reply. The other door, Anon. What the fuck? I sat there thinking. I definitely heard him calling out from the front. But at this stage, I can't be sure of my own senses. So I just call out that he shouldn't be lazy and should just come around to the front. It was a long pause as I stand at the open door. Then, come on and on. Don't be lazy. Come around and open the door. Now at this stage, I feel barely awake, hardly registering my steps as I move back down the corridor. As I near the side of the house where I scraped off all the barnacles, the rank smell increases steadily, and I approach the back door and look through the window to see if there's someone there. For a moment, I see nothing. Just the bare swamp on all sides. But then I turn to look on the other side of the door, and I see looking back at me a face so horrible I don't like to even think of it today. I scream and fall back, and it bolts. The shock left me dizzy and I thought I would vomit. The smell reeling together whatever sanity I had left I knew I had to board up the windows, lock the door, and wear out the night. As I regained my senses, I had to hold onto the wall, grab onto things to pull myself up onto two legs. Once I did, I was still wobbling on my ankles, like seasickness when I heard the unmistakable scatter of pots across the kitchen floor, and I turned and I realized that I'd left the front door wide open. The heaviness of the heat in the air seems to sink into my pores, and I'm weighted into the corner against the back door. The chills that ran down my body were palpable. I couldn't have made a sound if I wanted to. I was entirely fixated on sitting myself and listening with an utmost morphine clarity. The adrenaline, I guess. And again, the clash of disturbed cutlery. And the slow wheeze like a choked inhale. <sighs> when it was silent, and still I could barely contain my body shivers, my mind wasn't processing a thing except for any noise from the kitchen. I registered the cold impression of the door handle in my palm, but wouldn't dare turn it. And then, a soft crunch, like of skin pressing on the floor. I saw something white breaching into the corridor, and again the low wheeze. Leisurely, the small round eyes swiveled around and looked right at me. I bolted it through the door, and I saw a flash of white through the windows. Running for the open door, I thought. I burst forward blindly and ran, not knowing which direction or where. I couldn't afford to care that I was heading straight into the swamp. The idea of turning back for the car or going around the house was, well, once I started running, a debunked option. It didn't even occur to me. 
The feeling of mud permeating and squelching in your shoes and the knowledge of it caking there, making every step painfully loud. More than once my foot caught on a tough root and I fell over, but again I couldn't afford to recognize it and just got back up every time. There was no visibility even by the time my eyes should have adjusted to the light. Any moonlight was totally obscured by the overcrowding canopy. And as I ran there, there was no sounds. But by the time my body had run past its limit and I was drunkenly heaving through the trees, sweating, I heard a lot of bug noise on the water and occasionally snippets of birds' wings shaking off nearby and strange croaks. Frantically, I tried to pick out that awful wheeze, but I couldn't focus on it for any extended period, because doing so seemed to make the experience into a practical reality, instead of a fever dream as I was hoping it was. Now, there came a time when I wasn't even moving at speed, it was a sweated out mess, borderline unconscious and soaked in mud. There was no sign by which to gauge where I was. Only the huge figures of the trees around and the lumpen masses of the swamp. My knees started slipping under me, and I heard a splash that silenced all the bugs as I slumped into the water. My entire body succumbed to that pins and needles numbness all at once. Face half buried under the waterline, I only jerked my head up with difficulty, and the brackish water smelled richly of that sulfurous reek. For a long time, I lay there in a small pool to myself, my skin sensing nothing around it. Gradually, the bug noise returned on the water surface, and it seemed like I could hear the distinct clicks and water plops of each one. Nothing of the light nor sound changed. If there was a moon, it was lost under layers and layers of branches and clouds. It was impossible to tell how much time had passed. I couldn't even guess how long it had been till this weird noise emerged. Slowly, from somewhere to the east of me. But immediately, I knew it was no animal or forest sound, because it was the sound of television static. The bug life went quiet, and even the sound of the water in the canopy seemed to die out, as this thick white noise spread out and neared. It took all my strength to muster just one arm. There was now the quiet splish, splosh of feet in the water, growing louder. Outstretching the arm, it felt like every sinew in my shoulder would snap. My fingers gripped the first thing they found and I sensed my body being pulled forward. Somehow, mud covered, Shivering like all hell, and every joint burning, I slumped into the upturned husk of a log, and, out of the bare scraps of energy left in me, pulled myself fully into the dark tube. This muffled the dim splish splash of footfall, and in that hollowed out tree I sort of felt limp like a rag doll, unable to exert any more, but somewhere nearby... I heard that faint, wheezing sound. Now I couldn't control my breathing or stillness. I could see nothing but for the crescent slither of the log opening near my feet. The inside of the log was very cold and clingy, but my discomfort meant nothing as I strained to look out of the little crescent slit for visibility. For a moment, it was blotted out by something big and white. The sound of static was overwhelming as if a television had been dumped into the bog. But then the thing was gone, and in time the noise faded. And in time, the bug noise picked back up. Now, I don't know when I passed out. My clothes were wrapped around me and had dried there. This was the same for the mud in my shoes. For a moment I thought I was paralyzed. Then an inch of crushed log under me gave way and I realized I was half fossilized into the crap. My eyes were so encrusted with dirt and gunk that at first they wouldn't open, and there was a dull stinging as I peeled my eyelashes apart and the full light of the sun burned through. 
completely overwhelming my senses. Now, it took me a little while to realize that I was awake and where I was. The compost odor of the log's interior and the brushing sense of things moving around under me, and certain wet objects winding slowly through my hair, alerted me to that. The feeling of worms slithering across my scalp, curling at the roots of hairs, should have made me want to carve all my hair out. But there was no way to think about any of this that made sense anymore. I wanted only to pull myself out of the husk and back into the house. I knew I had to pack my things and not return. There was no recovering from this. Yet at some level, well, I knew how truly lost I was already, and how hot the day was, and how parched my throat and mouth were. My retinas were burned ragged with heat and too little sleep. As I lifted myself up, bending my knees and dragging my body out bottom first, I noticed something different under my arm. A distinct lack of feeling in my armpit. As I peeled myself out into the shallow pool of last night, shedding spiders and worms falling out of my hair, I examined myself. There were lots of cuts on my arm when the mud was scratched off. But then I lifted up my arm, and this time, there could be no calm, and I screamed aloud, again and again, when I saw the hole of my armpit, overfilled with a great hardened cluster of barnacles. I screamed so much I was dry heaving and fell onto my knees in the water. In a moment of panicked distraction, I forced myself to notice how the pool reflected the blue of the sky exactly. Without the blackened trees, the scene would appear like two intersecting planes of sky and grass. But the feeling of all those thousands of little shells forming piles in my armpit, and the little islands of them that filed down my arm and the dips of my ribs. Concentrating myself, improvising a gross curiosity, as I took my hand to the rock-like outer surface of the main lump and gritted my teeth as my nails scraped down, catching on some of the gaps, and then prying as hard as I fucking could. There was a loud crunch and a lightning bolt of pain struck my side, causing me to reel over once more. A crack had appeared in the lump, under which was the pinky end of the inner goop. But I couldn't shake the awful source of that pain. The feeling of their little thin roots pulling and popping in my skin. And finally, I vomited. The numbness of it now overcame by a hyper-awareness of all the little roots spread out in my body. It took my all just to push past the sensation to find a rock. With the rock firmly in hand and sweating hard, I brought it down once, twice, and again on the mass. Each time it cracked and popped, but the pain worsened and the throbbing horrible awareness of all those roots only increased, like they were clinging harder in there, in my skin, in my muscle. Somewhere through the trees, the smell of smoke, and I'm moving towards it full speed completely delirious. There's the whisper of a crackling fire, and all I could do was follow it, desperately. The emerald light of flames burned through the air, and the rich smell was so reassuring that for a moment, I forgot about the horrible things in my body. I stumbled out of the conifers into a small clearing, which looked like a drained patch of bog. There could be seen a crude sort of timber hut, looking hastily assembled from a few small trunks, offering very little cover. The fire was burning only a few meters off, unshielded from a pile of dry twigs and leaves, with no regard to the hut. Then my eyes were drawn to the outer rim of the clearing, marking its boundaries against the water, where had been erected several sharpened pikes, each adorned with the black faces of rotting animals. They mostly seemed to be dogs or possums, but 
but it was impossible to tell the degree to which most had rotted away. The sight of these things, intermittently swamped by the smoke, was something to behold. Who is it? came a voice, and it occurred to me that a figure was moving somewhere inside the wall of smoke. Please, I blurted, hardly coherent. I'm sick and I need help. The figure was still for a while, then moved forward, unshrouded by the blackness. I recognized immediately the bushman's old, young face, at first unsmiling, squinting, then beaming, alert and wide-eyed on seeing me, as if to say, Oh, I'm so glad you could make it. Now here my memory falters. I know I collapsed a few times, I maybe fainted, because, well, the, the guy told me so. To this day, I can't remember how we got into his hut, where I was splayed on an unstable stretcher bed and told to be still while he got something. The next thing I know is his dry old fingers are pressing something into my mouth. Pills. And I swallow automatically. Then while his fingers are in there, he sort of wriggles them about. I do remember them tasting like shit. He starts hooting with laughter, then a drink bottle nozzle, a drink of water to wash them down. I asked what it was and he busied himself with something in a bag for what seemed like minutes before announcing, Tram it all. As the painkillers took effect, I drifted in and out of sleep. When once or twice I woke, it was to see the man crouched at my side, working hard on the armpit, and a dull, scraping noise, but no feeling whatsoever. At his side, I caught sight of the ugliest-looking dog I'd ever seen in my life. It looked like it had crawled, fully formed, out of the swamp matter, its body either wet or hairless, looking like black mats of folded leather. There was a loud noise of blunt objects grinding against each other, a sick, pucking sound, and then the slow, slow shlup of the length of roots being dragged out, some snapping halfway out, where they dangled limp from bloody little holes under my arm. The sight made me nauseous and I looked to the dog, its grisly mouth unfolding into a friendly smile. As the man dropped the bulk of the barnacles into a bucket, where it hit with the soft, hard, wet sound of a hammer on a bunch of eggs wrapped in wet towel. Promptly, tail wagging, the dog dipped its snout into the bucket, emerging seconds later, panting, with limp, threaded mass in its jaws, its thick saliva running with blood as it crunched it up in painful-looking gulps. And as the dog did so, I noticed how its gums were crowded with little, dried-out scars, and I passed out. Now I came to some time later that day. The shadows were slanted at a new angle, making deeper shades. It seemed to be late afternoon. The day was still boiling, but a strip of grey clouds hung in the otherwise abandoned sky. A constant stream of wetness poured out of my bare chest and arms, and I could feel it pooling underneath me. Groaning, I moved on to my one good arm and nervously looked at the end results of the other. There was a lot of blood and dirt, and no bandages. There was also a series of small black holes crammed in my flesh under the arm. The hair, it seemed had been uprooted with the stuff, each leaking a little stream of blood, baked into a light crust by the heat. A couple still had small roots hanging out of them. Teeth gritted, I pulled these last remaining ones out, all too sensitive to the feeling of their wet length being peeled out, and the cold of the air on nerve endings and exposed meat in the newly excavated hole. As I leaned on the arm to sit up, I felt the ungodly sensation of all the holes stretching open and taking in a collective gasp of cool air. But 
and the fever seemed to be fading somewhat. I wanted to thank the man. He was nowhere to be seen and I was too weak to call for him. But I saw that the prehistoric looking dog was still by my side, panting happily. I put my hand down and rubbed the side of his face. Then, when it moved closer, I patted it slowly. It panted and drooled. The shadows grew longer and I managed to put both feet off of the bed, leaning at waist to pat the dog, which was loving it. It was the closest I had had to a normal experience in so long, that this simple activity felt like the greatest comfort in the world. And then the man stooped into the hut, grinning madly, and asked how I was doing. I told him good and thanked him profusely. As with the previous time, he seemed to zone out, just waiting to say his piece. Unceremoniously, he thrust me a plate of ill-smelling meat chunks, as if to shut me up. I was and am to this day a vegetarian, yet that rancid meat will probably always stand out in my mind as one of the best meals of my life. Glad I found you, he said more than once. He spoke in the same hurried pace as last time. If not more, he seemed to not want to discuss my health or how he removed the barnacles, opting instead to give me a long talk on the aboriginals. However, as he went on, it was clear he considered the barnacles just an extension of the aboriginal phenomena, some kind of tactic they used or form that they actually took. But it wasn't even that clearly defined. He connected patterns with all the enthusiasm of a conspiracy theorist, all the time chucking his dog little chunks off of his plate, eating none of it himself. Somewhere in the distance, a series of whoop sounds hollered. My ragged nerves demanded I jarringly stick my head out in that direction, and the old guy just went on talking. I observed that the sky was quickly becoming more overcast. They were getting trickier, he said. But the end was so near. I asked him how far it was to town. He didn't hear or care, and gave me a stern look as he said he knew he was close now. He'd found pictures of her, he said, and his eyes lit up. He pulled two mud-caked volumes from his bag, and with panicked fingers he flipped them open, both to the pages he wanted to show me. I examined them. One was an old etching, or photograph, it was hard to tell. The other, a woman's weekly magazine from a few years ago. In each, he had drawn a hard circle around a face in the background, in both a woman, though it was clearly not the same person. I nodded regardless and said, uh, This your wife? Now he stood up, his plate crashing onto the floor. How the fuck you know that, eh? He yelled. The dog released the low whine, recognizing the change in atmosphere. The sky was pocketed with light patches. Drizzle was beginning to fall. Improvising out of fear, I said that he had told me about it at my house the other day and repeated what I'd heard from my friend in town, but as if I wholeheartedly believed it. As he listened, he seemed confused, then weakened, almost apologetic, and he sat back down, picking up the plate and continuing to feed the dog half-heartedly. Yeah, I did, did, didn't I? He mumbled, convincing himself as he spoke. I realized that he did not know how many days had passed since we'd met, and struggled to bring the memory into clear focus. His face was a picture of frustration. Then, a light moved across his face and he was back to the big smiles and frantic speech. They had her in a glass vault, he said. In the middle of a carving out in the dry patch of woods, they used rituals. Didn't play by our rules. They were, as he said, disgusting. So disgusting. As he said this, he threw pieces of meat into the dog's mouth faster and faster. At first, I thought she was just getting old and seeing things, he said. But then we found footprints heading to the house. 
There was none leading back. That's when I knew they were coming for her. And now they want me. They want to draw me out, luring me with these pictures. He produced more magazines, with almost every page showing a circled woman's face. He went on and on about how they disgusted him, about how the only way to get her back was to play their game, however long it took. But he kept returning to disgust, how much they disgusted him. The rain beat harder and harder, dripping through the wide spaces in the roof of the hut, and it seemed to push him deeper into the spiral he was on, of talking about his disgust, once he said that he couldn't shake it and seemed to be unable to contain his disgust. Then he grabbed the dog's snout hard and yanked it towards me. You see that? He shouted over the rain, thrusting the whining dog forward. See what they do? Forcibly, impervious to its attempts to wriggle away, he pulled its lips up and pointed out the hole ridden gums. You see? He screamed, more worked up than ever. The rain was splashing through, quite strong now. His eyes were furious. He seemed not to notice as the dog cried and dug its claws into his hands, hard enough to draw blood. He had gripped its top and bottom lips hard and was screaming more and more, as if to drown out its cries. You see what they do? As he pulled the top and bottom jaws wide open. No. I said weakly as there was a little crack and the dog gave a long howl of pain and began wriggling harder and faster, battling its master's hands incessantly for him to stop. But he only pulled harder. How disgusting it is. Even as I limply raised an arm to protest, a line of blood was forming at the sides of the dog's mouth. Wasting no time to collect himself, he pulled up an already sharpened pike, and in what seemed like one movement, I picked up the dog and dragged its entire body through the pike. As of reading my mind, he said, with a gradual return to his vaguely sad confusion, they have to be alive for the rituals. He shuffled out of the hut, bearing the pike on his back. I knew I had to escape, but the rain was only getting worse. So I went out, foolishly to observe his efforts in clearing the ground and drilling the base of the pike into the ground, establishing one more totem. But I noticed the sense of something about him. He let go of the pike and, rain running through his scuffled beard, stared out into the forest. I followed his gaze, past the line of conifers and the overlapping walls of mist just in time to see it. A huge old pine, bending at the middle, shaking slightly, almost bouncing back into place, shedding a coat of water into the air. Then the tops of the trees, huge trees, rustled with the movement of something pushing them apart. As we stood under the fresh pike, there was a roll of thunder in the woods, but it wasn't thunder. It was a higher noise, like metal plates ground against one another, followed by a set of huge impending thuds that sent vibrations up my legs. Under the noise of the rain, I was aware of the sound of thick static and started backing into the hut. The old man stayed out in the mud and rain and began shouting things I couldn't hear. There was another deafening groan, and a dark shape brushed through the highest tops of the trees momentarily. The old guy was at the wall now, picking something up. A rifle. There was a click, and then immediately he fired. Come on, he was screaming. Come on, you fuckers. There was another shot, and another. The tectonic groans came more and more, and the trees were being bent and pushed by something massive behind them. And the old man, screaming at them in the rain to show themselves. Where is she? He screamed, red face and wet, and saliva streaming from his scarred mouth as he hollered, releasing a volley of shots in all directions. I moved to the edge of the door, slipping behind him in the frothing mud, 
all the while keeping my eyes on the forest line, transfixed in a sort of horrible wonder by the huge things in the pines. Through his screams, I could hear the wavering vibrato of tears. And then I saw it. If only for a second, this enormous black shape moving behind the trees, then a long, tree-like limb stretching out and wobbling forward, testing the air like a feeler. The static sound and sulfur smell were richer than ever now. The air felt electric, and then two more stood up at full height and were taking ground-shaking strides towards the hut. One snapped its lump of what I suppose was a head right around, and I caught sight of two white eyes. It was too much for me. I turned and ran. I stumbled in the rain and cracked my ribs. Pulling myself up, I hobbled off as fast as possible, hardly able to see through the rain, as volleys of faraway bullets exploded against the deep tectonic scrapings of the huge things. And over top of it all, the man's wild voice, screaming its lungs out. Where is she? I ran for I don't know how long, splashing face down in every other rivulet, getting mangled by every other thorny bush. The landscape was totally changed in the rain, overflowing with little waterfalls and the nervous swaying off old trees in the wind. The commotion was overwhelming and as I crashed my way through the dense brush, I became alerted to some calls. It was my name, in my friend's voice. Fuck this, I thought, and I turned to run in the opposite direction, foot snagging on a collapsed branch. I yanked desperately at it, the voice getting closer and closer until finally it broke apart and I sprinted forward, directly into the thing. I screamed as its arms thrusted out of the trees and grabbed me by the shoulders and tried wildly to escape, until I was looking at the terrified, confused face of my friend from the town, and his two buddies trailing not far behind. Now I'll keep the rest of this brief. Needless to say, I refused to return to the house. I was driven by my friends back to one of theirs. They reckoned I was suffering from exposure and got me a change of clothes and things. I was either unable or unwilling to tell my story in full. To this day, I remain quite unwilling, for obvious reasons. I only showed them the holes in my armpit and the parts about the mad bushman. I deliberately cut out everything else. Back in the comfort of a lit warm room, with the storm rattling the windows outside, as if taking place somewhere far, far away. I no longer trusted my own experience and fell into a sort of waking, lucid dream state. Not quite conscious or rational, but nonetheless aware of the impossibility of my own experience. But how had they found me, I asked. They exchanged odd, worried glances then I was told their story. We went to your house at the arranged time. When we got there, we saw all the windows and doors were locked, even though it was sweltering. So we knocked on the door and there was no reply. We figured you had just gone for a walk or something, so we sat on the front porch, smoking durries, and cracked a few beers. A full hour passed and we decided to get up and go. Right as we did, though, here he paused, obviously uncertain about how to retell his next part. Well, someone shouted out from inside the house, saying you weren't home. I was awash with full-fledged body shivers as he said those words. Well, we thought, what the fuck? Seeing as we'd been there for an hour and only now this guy decides to speak up. So we ask who it is. No reply. So we knock again, and this voice, coming from directly behind the door, says that you've gone into the swamp. Well, we keep on asking questions, asking to be let in, knocking at the door, but we got no more responses. At first, we thought, well, you know, that it was just you pulling a prank. But as the rain came in, 
figure we ought to at least check just in case. I let this information sink in. Then I asked, Why did they think it was me pulling a prank? I mean, why would I do that? Now the mood got really awkward and many more glances were exchanged. Well, said my friend slowly, looking right into my eyes. Well, the thing is, it was your voice. The next few days were spent recuperating. My friends said that they would put me up until I found a different place, but it was clear now I couldn't continue there. I was no longer myself, didn't act the same, seemed rattled out of my own persona. And I knew the popular consensus was that I had gone mad. I got looks in the street. I didn't blame them. When I resigned from the teaching position, it seemed a relief to the other staff. I guess word of my descent into madness spread fast. Only my friends, who heard for themselves that unexplainable voice, believed me. They were good to me in the following days, returning to the house I was never to go back to, and collecting my stuff. Three weeks later, I was driving back home to a family who cried a lot and kept saying I would get better. More for their own sake than mine. But I did get better, in time. I kept in touch with the friends I made there and completed my thesis on the back of the short experience I'd had. Now I won't bore you with the details of my reintegration period, except that it was hard and still ongoing. There is only one more thing to add though. It happened as the place was being emptied of my stuff. One of those people who helped was the school teacher who'd been so kind to me. And like the blokes who found me out in the woods, didn't treat me like a nutter. She said it almost in passing for some reason, though I'm uncertain she was aware of its full meaning. She said, You know, it's no wonder you came across the old swamp bloke. That place you were staying in was the house where he and his wife used to live. <laughs>